Welcome to life, bringing you insight and experiences into love, relationships, and fertility, with a focus on enjoying life and moving forward. On today's podcast, we'll be speaking with Rabbi Elon Siegelman regarding fertility and Judaism. Welcome to life, love, insight, fertility, experiences. I am here today with Rabbi Elon Siegelman, who is from one of the largest, most profound fertility organizations. It is such a pleasure to have you here today, and I am going to ask you if you could please tell us about the organization and about yourself, and thank you very much for being here. Uh, Lori, the pleasure is mine. Thank you for having me. It's a real honor to be here to address uh, this important topic to all of your listeners, and it's a topic that really has to be addressed, has to be brought out to the forefront, because the more people know the more people are informed, the more empowered uh, we will be to make the right decisions, to get the best care. Uh, It's it's really, it's an honor to be here, so thank you. As you mentioned, my name is Rabbi Elon Siegelman. Uh, I'm a rabbi in Queens, congregation, uh, in I have a congregation in Kew Gardens Hills, and I'm also the rabbi of Pua. I am the rabbinic advisor for PUA in America. PUA is a very large organization that has an incredible starting point. Yeah, PUA actually began in Israel Mm -hmm. about 30 years ago as a response to the rabbinic, uh, as the, the rabbinic response to the new fertility treatments that that were coming into the world when when Louise Brown was born about 40 years ago, there was a big question mark in the Orthodox Jewish community whether such treatment would be permissible and accepted into the community. And unfortunately, the initial response was actually quite negative. They they didn't really want people doing these treatments. And I believe it was because of that dark unknown. Nobody really knew much about it. Uh, Really no one knew what was happening. I had the opportunity to speak to a priest about Catholicism and Catholicism was going through the same thing in many ways. It's what do we do? You know, where did science and that that question mark, what, when it was described, you know, it was so different than natural conception. The thought of having sperm extracted from the male and, 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 uh, and oocytes from the female and forming embryos in a laboratory to then be, transferred back into the womb was such a foreign thought, almost impossible to comprehend. It, the automatic response was, that's not for us. And some, some rabbis even admitted that their opposition was predicated on this thought that it wasn't gonna take off, that it's not really worth it for me to bend over backwards to permit such a treatment when this is just science fiction, it's not really going to take Wow. It's not going to become What's mainstream. So unbelievable about what you're saying. Family is such a key and central role in the Orthodox community. Absolutely. You know, that, that really is a fantastic point. Uh, and that's why, you know, I believe that if the, the questioners, the people who are asking the question, if they weren't so deep rooted in family, they would have accepted the answer and walked away. You know, when the rabbi says no, the rabbi says no. But we see if you fast forward, 35 years, I, I can't even imagine what those rabbis of, of yesteryear, you know, really of 30, 40 years ago, would say today, looking at the wide stream acceptance of fertility treatment in most Orthodox communities, or almost all Orthodox communities. In fact, there is a fascinating series of response about, written by one of the leading rabbis in Israel named Rav Moshe Sternbach. And Ramosha Sternbach has a collection of written responses to these questions. And at first, he wrote unequivocally that th- this is inappropriate. This type of treatment is inappropriate, and we should, not, uh, we should not engage in such treatment. And over the years, 20 plus years, if you follow it, his, his writings, he shifts. At first, it's small shifts, as you know, going from that hardcore no to maybe a softer perhaps moving all the way to the other side of the spectrum that one is actually actually obligated 
to undergo such treatments wow. because of that mitzvah, because of that commandment and obligation to procreate and to fill the world with children. So I think what changed was the acceptance in the world, medicine advanced, and people just really saw that this got off the ground. It took off in such a positive way with so many children, thousands and thousands and thousands of children being born due to this reproductive uh, technology. And, and therefore, so that actually did shift the response. Of, Do you want of, a rabbi of, to have that kind of influence? I, I, he happens to be quite an influential rabbi in Israel, but it's not just him. I'm, I'm using him as an example, but I believe that this is, that this is uh, the same approach that many, many, many rabbis have taken. And you can follow in their writings, you can follow the shift, uh, it's, which is just unbelievably fascinating and, and beautiful to see how, how Jewish law, obviously the, the concepts don't change, the concepts which are deep rooted in the Torah, so those don't change, but the application given modern medicine, given modern society and technology, the applications uh, do change. Something like electricity. The Torah doesn't address electricity because electricity wasn't around thousands of years ago, but the application of the Torah principles fit into electricity perfectly and we can apply them and we live our lives uh, daily with the Torah's perspective on electricity. So too, we have the Torah's approach to fertility treatment, which again, wasn't available uh, what I think is so wonderful about what you're saying is that the religion was able to keep up with the science. Absolutely. So your organization, if we can go back to that for a minute, what does your organization do? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. So let me, let me go back to 30 years ago when, when the, the people, couples who uh, did not have children, saw this technology being introduced to the world and they quickly ran to their rabbis for guidance. And as I mentioned, unfortunately, many of the rabbinic authorities said no. And the reason, one of the reasons for this opposition was the unknown what was going on in the lab. When the sperm comes in and the egg uh, comes, is, is, um, you know, the, is retrieved, and the, and the fertilization takes place, it's done behind closed doors. No one really knew what was going on. And to go back to that point that you mentioned, the, 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 the family and lineage is so important to us in our Jewish faith. Should there be a, an option or an opportunity, heaven forbid, that the wrong embryo, the wrong genetic material would be implanted in the wrong woman, that could present serious, serious issues to Jewish lineage. And, and therefore, many rabbis said that we should not engage in fertility treatments. And it was really Machon Pua, uh, the Pua Institute, uh, 30 years ago, that decided that, hey, wait, if we can set up and organize some type of supervision and observation procedure in the labs to see to it that everything is fine, there will be no mix-ups, there will be uh, no... Uh, genetic material from one woman implanted into the next or one man into into the next someone else's wife so perhaps we can uh, begin to permit such treatments because again that issue will not be on the table and that's really how Pua began. Pua began by uh, by really by brainstorming and it was a, a small group of rabbis led by Rav Menachem Borstein uh, in, in, in Israel. How can we set up a system to allow for couples to undergo treatment according to Jewish law? That was the mission. And any obstacle... Now, I apologize, but so 30 years ago, we weren't a donor egg and donor sperm, and surrogacy was not as prevalent. Correct. We were just talking about basic IVF and, 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 and IUI. Okay at that point IVF you know the in vitro fertilization yeah and the medication to elicit more eggs would be okay to use sure yeah at that time really one of the main issues was as soon as you have genetic material leaving the body which yes. again is so foreign from natural conception absolutely yeah then we needed to address that issue and resolve it um, so that's how Pua began. Pua began with a team of observers uh, and the rabbinic, uh, the rabbinic body 
which was the kind of the brain behind this mission. When you say observers, do you mean the Orthodox community? Members of the Orthodox community would actually enter the operating room and the, and the clinic and follow the genetic material, whether it's the sperm or the egg or both, mm -hmm. and follow from the moment it leaves the body until the point where it's implanted back into the body or discarded or whatever is happening with it so that we will have proof with our own two eyes that everything is being done without any question. Just sim are there similar. Certain, are there certain doctors or certain labs people go to for, for fertility treatment when they're following the orthodox and just, just to let people know in case they don't, um, Judaism is comprised of three general practices, which would be Reform, Conservative, and Orthodox. Um, it's typically the Orthodox that would follow the letter of the law, so to speak, not that others don't have thoughts and feelings about it. Of course they do, especially in times of crisis. But the organization was really developed for the Orthodox community, which we'll talk a little bit more about. and and the different teachings in the Orthodox community. So I just wanted to kind of add that into the conversation. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's a, it's a very important point. With these um, doctors or labs, because I'm thinking, okay, well, the, somebody from the Jewish community is going to have the role of now following the egg and the sperm, but then it's going to go to the lab and be in the lab for five days, right? Three right. to five days. Yeah. So, I mean, we can fast forward to today. That, that's really how the organization began. It was a response, to, um, it was a response to, to open the doors to so many couples who didn't have children and who weren't, weren't getting the permissibility to engage in these, in these treatments. Who will open those doors? And that's really, if we fast forward to today, who is all about opening doors? Who is an organization... What was that? What a great slogan to have. We're all about opening doors. We're opening doors. We don't want Jewish law to close doors for people. Now we stay strict to the law, as you mentioned. You mentioned we, you know, we're an Orthodox organization, and we, you know, we are governed by the Torah and Orthodox law. So therefore, we will not break anything. But within the law, there are so many opportunities to open doors and not to close them. So, you know, something as an example, you mentioned before, like egg donation and sperm donation and, and, um, and surrogacy. So those are highly controversial topics, but within the Orthodox Jewish community, there's a lot of door openings that can, that can take place. Some, some rabbis um, have a more closed approach. Our personal approach at Pua again, completely within Orthodox Judaism and with the approval of, of a number of mainstream Orthodox rabbis is to open those doors and allow women who are unable, couples who are unable to have children due to uh, an egg factor or a uterine factor or a sperm factor to go ahead and have children, albeit with a third party, whatever it may be, but certainly under, uh, you know, in the, under the envelope and under the umbrella of, of Orthodox Jewish law. So, if we fast forward to today, what our organization looks like, we have three main missions. Number one, as I mentioned before, as we began with supervision, offer, offer, we offer supervision in the labs. Um, I, you know, we're in New York, so many of the Manhattan labs, as well as, uh, as the Los Angeles, we have a Los, West Coast branch, and really everywhere in between the East Coast and West Coast, uh, we have very, very wonderful working relationships with the lab directors, uh, and the doctors all across the country. And, um, and we have observers, which are religious Jewish, mostly Jewish women, um, who are on really, on, on a moment's notice, willing to drop everything and get into a car and drive to a lab because there was a last minute procedure, a last minute sperm freeze, a last minute retrieval, a transfer, whatever it may be. And we gotta be there. Um, and they're there. It's a tremendously challenging and uh, and difficult job, but these women are are angels. God sent angels that care so much about the Jewish people and about God's children and making more children that they will drop everything to see to it that those couples have the opportunity to do what they need to do under Jewish law uh, without any without any questions. So that's supervision, and we 
so where does the com I, I hate to bring up conflict but where does some of the controversy come in because some people um some of the rabbis don't accept it and some of them do accept it and so some communities are accepting and some communities are not and that must are you, refer are you referring to ibf or, your, or or supervision or both some of the ibf i'm referring to some of the donor and the donor yeah. Hey, donor sperm surrogacy. There's so many options now to create a family. It used to be adoption. And so what we've seen is adoption rates go down as the other things go up. Um, and adoption actually is not that easy these days, not for any religion. So that's what I'm referring to is the change in the, in the philosophies of different communities. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Thank, thankfully, mainstream Orthodox Judaism mainstream Orthodox Judaism does allow for at, at least, at least IVF, you know, the husband's sperm and the woman's egg being conceived and uh, fertilized in the lab and then being implanted back into the, you know, the man's own wife. When we're just dealing with those two individuals, husband and wife, and they just need a little of uh, medical assistance, mainstream Orthodox rabbis do permit such treatments there are i don't want to call them outliers but there are more there are rabbis in the ultra orthodox community perhaps some in the hasidic community that question and sometimes don't allow but even then i've spoken to numerous hasidic rabbis um who who are in charge of their population of thousands of tens of thousands hundreds of thousands uh, and they are actually quite intimately familiar with the ins and the outs of IVF, and they do they they do they do permit it. So I'm I'm happy and and um, and privileged to say here on the air that I would say the majority of Orthodox Judaism does permit and even celebrate the fact that we have an opportunity to expand. Uh, to expand the, the population, the Jewish population, and to allow for those couples who were terribly broken, unable to conceive without this assistance, to go ahead and and have that opportunity to become parents and to partake in the community. Yeah. So when you say terribly broken, you know that that touches me because I do so much work with support groups and individual counseling and couples counseling related to fertility. Your organization also provides counseling, doesn't it? I, I Absolutely. So that would be that would be the next thing that we do. So supervision is one branch of the organization. I apologize. We need to, to change the branch. No, no, perfect. Let's let's go there. The the second the second branch, the second thing that we do, our second mission is that of guidance and support. And guidance and support looks very different. Guidance and support could be questions that people have with Jewish religion where they want to know how does Jewish law allow me to go ahead with my fertility treatment? For instance, my doctor told me I should do A, B, and C. Is that permissible according to Jewish law? And there are so many questions that people have to make sure that their treatments are being done in accordance to Jewish law, uh, where some, ra some of their local Orthodox rabbis may not have that knowledge because it's a certain level of expertise that not everyone has. Right. So PUA is the organization um, which focuses on those um, highly complicated and sophisticated questions. And some are more simple and basic and others are co more complicated. And we offer that, that service to the Jewish community to help them navigate their fertility journey within the framework of Jewish law. So I'm wondering, actually, as you're talking, I was going to ask you before, do you do a lot of education to the doctors as well as the rabbis? Of you're, the Laura, you're on to, that's already the third branch, so we'll get there in a minute. Okay. But we're just on the second. We're on our second branch, our second mission. Our second mission, the first one was supervision in the labs. Our second mission is guidance and support. So the and, woman comes to you, and she says, or the couple comes to you, and they say, you know, we have to go through this treatment. We don't know what to do. We're struggling with it. And not only are we struggling with it, our parents who are even more religious than we are, we're Orthodox, but they're, I don't know, I would use the word ultra Orthodox. You would use a more appropriate term. I'm sorry, so I don't mean to be offensive, but they are really 
really against it. Like, what, what do we do? We want to have a family. And I actually know a story of somebody who, I would say she was conservative. She was in one of my support groups and um, her, her family was orthodox and they found fertility medication in her closet and they were very upset with her for fertility medication. That's a really hard, you know, that, that's a really hard dynamic. And, and I have spoken to, I've spoken to parents. I, I have spoken to parents. We're actually planning on running an event. Um, this one for the parents of single women, single women who are interested in egg freezing and fertility preservation, um, how the parents can help their children, their daughters, and, and not stress them out. People who make comments like, when am I going to be? When am I going to be a zaidi? When am I going to be a grandfather? When are you, you know, when are you going to give me, you know, when are you going to get married? All your other siblings are married. Some of those comments, although in the parents' eyes are not significant, they could be so terribly hurtful and insensitive to the patient themselves, or the couple, or or the or the, or the, the single who's going through such such a difficult time you know people don't mean anything by these statements that become so hurtful and and you know tormenting because they want to say listen if i could do it i would do it i'm so glad that you're having that i i think it's so yeah so we're gonna have a, you know a special i mean it, since COVID happened it may turn into a virtual webinar but as opposed to an in-person gathering but uh, an, an evening of education and 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 support for the parents uh, of of women who are undergoing or who, who would like to undergo um, fertility preservation. And also a lot of the parents have no idea what that means. They don't understand the science. They don't understand the cost behind it. They really are just so out of the picture. So let's bring them into the picture. The more they know, the more informed they are, hopefully the easier it will be on the family. And Hopefully, they'll be even more helpful to their daughters in, in whichever angle, you know, they could be of service. And hopefully, um, but, an opportunity for them to express their concerns and their fears and their anxiety and their stress over it. Um, so that that's a wonderful venue. We had chatted for a second, not that we have to go into it because I want to continue the conversation about there's a, a small movement of single women having babies now, too. So this fits right into the conversation of preservation. Very interesting. Absolutely. So Absolutely. you give the parents the room to talk about it or offer services for them as well? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I get, I do get calls from parents and they say, listen, what am I supposed to do? My daughter, she's been married for, for four years, no children. I want to help her, but I also don't want to be a nudge. I don't want to be a nuisance and I don't want to offend her. How do I balance the fact that I want to help her. I want to be resourceful, but I don't want to offend her. So right. we, we do get we do get those questions quite That's often. A very nice way for a parent to put it, because sometimes they'll say, I don't know what to say anymore. All we're doing is getting upset with each other, and I, I don't say the right thing. Or the right. woman will say to me, my parents and my family never say the right thing. Right. right. No, and especially around the holiday season, you know, Passover and Shavuot, you know, when usually, typically, not this year, but typically families gather together aunts, uncles, cousins, nieces, nephews, the whole family, um, and often, inevitably, those comments come up, you know, at the, at the holiday table, conversation about children, and, hey, how come, you know, it's been, hasn't it, when did you get married again? Weren't you, haven't you been married for three years? Come on, get to work, guys. Something, a comment like that, which seems like an innocent comment but it could be it could be a disastrous a disastrous comment for, for the struggling couple right right i hope people are starting to pick up on that that's what we're trying to do we're trying to you know break the stigma and and become a little bit more out there so people will read about us see what's going on learn more about infertility and take a step back and say maybe i should be a little bit more careful before i make a comment like that because I just saw a webinar, I read an article, and, and I may have a little bit of an insight as to what they're going through. I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to offend them. I wouldn't want to get them upset. Through this area of, of Pulat, you're able to provide um, education and counseling as to the treatment and as to coping with going through infertility treatment. And I know it feeds right into the third avenue, which is navigating the system. And yeah. 
what do you do when your community is a community where if you said you needed more treatment, they would not be happy with it and you would feel very like an outcast or maybe you would be outcast. What do you do at that point with somebody who is somebody who wants to be observant? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. And, um, and that, that speaks of the third, the third branch, which is the education. So again, the first one was supervision. The second one was guidance and support. And guidance and support is medical questions, referrals, Jewish, you know, questions in Jewish law, as well as the emotional component. We have a we have a, a team called the Pua Cares team, which is made up of uh, therapists and social workers who are professionals and have a you know dedicate some of their time just to speak with our couples and singles who are going through fertility challenges. And, uh, and to offer that support. So that's a really, really essential service um, that we're lucky and privileged to be able to offer to the Jewish community. And the, third, and the third branch, and we'll get to your point now, is that of education. And education um, looks very different. Education, as you said, could be education of the doctors. We have a number of programs that we run with different labs. I've gone you know, across the country speaking in, in, actual, in labs to the medical team from the actual reproductive endocrinologist to the lab technician to the lab director, they're all there. It's usually like a lunch and learn. It's a great, it's a great afternoon. The staff loves it because they get free lunch. They sit down and I lecture sometimes once, twice, three times, depending on how frequently I go. Um, and, and we talk about religious, the sensitivities of being a religious Jew and what it means to undergo fertility treatment as an Orthodox Jew. Things like Shabbos, right, on Saturday. When the doctor says something like, oh, why don't you come in for monitoring on Saturday? So to the Orthodox Jew, that's, how am I going to do that? How am I going to get into a car? How am I going to travel on Shabbos? I'm not allowed to drive. On Shabbos, I'm not allowed to do these things. But for a nurse or a, you know, or a doctor that doesn't know better, so they may just be fueling this fire, which is burning inside of them, of, of discomfort, of anxiety. And now I have to add Shabbos into the equation. It could just make it so much worse. Uh, and all different types of issues where there can be a conflict between Jewish law and fertility. So we address those issues and inform and educate the doctors how they can go about handling the situation and treating an Orthodox Jewish patient with the utmost respect and sensitivity uh, to make everyone happy. The patient will be happy. And when the patients are happy, the doctors are happy. The doctors will have more patients because patients will want to go to them. It works out wonderfully. And, and really we get better care. The Jewish community gets better care because of these, these sessions. So we educate doctors and we educate rabbis because when, 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 the, when the community approach their rabbi to ask whether something is permissible or not, when the, when the community approach the rabbi for guidance and advice, instead of the rabbi saying no, instead of the rabbis turning them away and saying, this is not something that our community uh, endorses, on the contrary, let Pua teach you all, all of the material out there. Let us inform you and educate you about the different rabbinic opinions and you'll see your, for yourselves how the answer is yes and how we can say yes to those couples. And as I said before, open doors. So the more rabbinic education we have, the more acceptance, overall acceptance in the Jewish community we're able to gain. Yeah, which is wonderful. I know at times, though, um, I hate I hate to bring this up, but I'm going to. Um, at times, I've heard of women and and men moving from one community to the other if they wanted to use a donor egg or they wanted to go to a surrogate because the community was not accepting. And at that point, I suppose that's very challenging for you as well when they if they come to you. Yeah, we, you know when we talk about donor eggs and and surrogacy. So as I said before. You know, third party isn't as accepted as, as mainstream IVF. Right. Oh. So it's true that everything that I'm speaking up until now is really kind of ends at IVF. Once we enter the world of third party, then we have uh, a number of different opinions amongst the Orthodox spectrum. Some of the most world renowned leading rabbis, as ultra Orthodox as you could get, permit third party and others do not. So there is more of a sensitive issue. Um, one of my, I mean, no week goes by, I wanna say even almost no day goes by without a question about egg donation and surrogacy or sperm donation. And it's really, it's become, you know, just 
not because I'm an expert in this, but just because I have so much familiarity uh, every day dealing with these issues, speaking to different rabbis and speaking to different doctors about it. It's kind of become my expertise, you know, third party, uh, how to navigate it in the Jewish community. Uh, I have, I have had the privilege to have many conversations with leading Orthodox rabbis. Some of, as I mentioned, the most ultra Orthodox as you could get that have given us the green light and we're helping women uh, who have a uterine factor, who need a surrogate, uh, or, or women with premature ovarian failure, who need an egg donation, or women, you know, fragile X, gen the genetic disorders, the Kleinfelter syndrome patients who need sperm donation. You know, it really runs the gamut. Um, and, and thankfully, there's, there are so many leading rabbis with an open, with an open mind um, that, that really do allow for all this to take place under the guidelines of strict Jewish law. I'm so happy to hear that's changing. Yeah, or that it really is changing. Moving. Yeah. It probably will continue to move as the years go on, I'm hoping, because it's a horrible struggle to go through and then to have to leave your community um, where you go to services every week or more than every week and you you spend weekends or sh and Shabbos with, um, in case people aren't familiar with Shabbos, it's, it's you know, the Sabbath in the Jewish religion where people are, are home and with friends and family. And it's about family in many ways. And I'm glad to hear that that's starting to change because to have to leave that and also go through the fertility struggle at the same time is a very hard thing for anybody to cope with. Right, absolutely. It's the community. Mm -hmm. The more education that the community is exposed to, the more informed they are about fertility treatment, about fertility acceptance. So their perspective will change drastically. You know, people who don't know anything about fertility treatment, they just think there's some crazy God forsaken treatment that no only one in a million people go through. You are that person that goes that, that goes through. That's crazy. But once they begin to open up and to see how common it is, how accepted, and what exactly it entails. So number one, they'll have a more general accepting nature towards it. And then when they go into even the nitty-gritty, we'll call it, exactly what it entails, the shots, the prep, the monitoring, the the blood work the ultrasounds so then they'll even have an appreciation wow you're going through you're what you're going through ivf i can't imagine is there anything i can do for you can i send you know can i send pizza to your house thursday night so or you know can i prepare meals for the weekend once that once there, that shift takes place where people understand what other what their neighbors are going through and i say neighbors because inevitably it's all over the place one in eight one in seven couples, one in eight couples, whatever the number is now, it's everywhere. It's your neighbor. It's your cousin. It's you're, you're saying that, that about educating the community as well. I actually just finished a book I wrote about um, donor egg. I'm going to send it to oh, the, wow. sending it to the publisher in the next couple of weeks. Some of the illustrations. Wow, very nice. Good luck. I would love. I would love to read it. Oh, I'd love for you to read it. It's just a simple story. It's not a scientific story. But it's to educate and it's to help actually people become comfortable with the concept. Mm -hmm. Because that's the key, understand it and become comfortable with it and gain knowledge. And that will empower you to be able to open up your mind to change. So that's what the rabbis did actually who started Pulat from what you said. And now it's kind of like bringing everybody up along the road with you. That's yeah. right, that's right. At every step in the way, there are always challenges and you know, when, when um, we just had a there, was a, there was a real big tumult in the community about, about uterine transplants. You know, when the newest technology um, is introduced, so what happened 30, 40 years ago is happening on a smaller scale, but it's always happening. The rabbis always have to address the issue, address the technology that's being introduced, kind of dissect it and figure out what exactly it is from a medical perspective, how does that fit into the Jewish law and what is going to be our overall approach? Now, inevitably, you're going to have different approaches. As you said before, reform, conservative, orthodox, and even amongst orthodox Jews, there's going to be a difference of opinion. But let's take a uter uterine transplant. For the most part, it's, it's, been accept it's accepted as medical, as medical um, technology advances and it'll become more widespread, hopefully. 
So then we'll, we'll see more and more of it. Right now it's quite limited. But, but there was that, that same discussion, that same conversation that took place 40 years ago about IVF just took place around uterine transplants. So we yeah. see that constant, constant conversation based on what's being introduced. And the, the amazing part about the Orthodox community is that they very, very, very heavily rely and consult with their rabbi before they take action. Not just about fertility, but about many, many things in life. So the rabbi has a huge influence on the community. So for them to be able to have somebody like you to educate them and teach them is, is wonderful. It's a blessing really for the community because they need that. They need people who are knowledgeable, open-minded and able to kind of get some perspective on the situation so they could share the information in a non-judgmental manner. And that's really so, so wonderful about Pulak because you accept anybody who comes to you um, who needs this assistance and needs the guidance, whether it's the person going through it, the parent, the relative, the doctor, or the rabbi. That's so right. It's an incredible organization, and I'm, I'm so glad that we were able to have you on today. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to cover, but I think this was wonderful information and an incredible resource for anybody who's Jewish or Orthodox or who just wants an insight into how religion uh, for the Jewish population evolved with fertility. Yeah, th I really thank you for having me. Um, the message I would just like to share is that there are so many resources available for the Jewish community. I'm sure for every community, I just know the Jewish community. There are so many resources that are available and people ha may have this perception that if I ask the rabbi, he's just gonna say no, that's not true. It may be true, but you will always be surprised. There's so many people that are surprised. When they asked the rabbi, they were expecting a no, 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 and they got a yes, or they got a different response. We want to work with you. And as we always say, it's much easier to say no than it is to say yes. Everyone can say no, but in order to say yes and to be able to support yourself, you need that wide breadth of knowledge, that experience, and the familiarity with the medication, the technology, Jewish law, with that, all of that. And that really is uh, the expertise of Pua. We have a rabbinic team in Israel. Uh, myself, we have a rabbinic team. I have uh, you know, a few partners here in, in, in New York, on the West Coast, in, Wait, in Australia. Just, I'm sorry for interrupting you, but what you just said I think is so important because it's so much harder to say yes than it is no. And it's so much harder for the person going through a fertility journey to have the strength to say to their rabbi, I really want this. I need you to listen. I need you to wait a minute. And then to take the control to decide what they're going to do based on their rabbi's answer. I can't tell you how many times, I can't tell you how many times I'll tell a, I'll tell a caller, listen, I'm not comfortable, but hold on. Let me consult with someone else. Let me consult with one of my, with what, with one of my partners. Let me consult with a different rabbi. Let's, let's not, let's not close it here. Let's not end the conversation here. Let me get back to you. Because yeah. a lot of these questions are complicated. A lot of these questions are, are, are nuanced. And even speaking it out with other rabbis, getting their perspective and their knowledge will bring us closer to, to opening those doors that that couple needs. I think that that's so important for people to take away from this conversation. You don't have to take no as an answer. Yeah, absolutely. I would encourage anyone that has any questions uh, on fertility, um, whether it's related to Jewish law or the medical, the medical side, to please pick up the phone and call us. You can Google, you know, puafertility.org. You can call us on, you know, you can find the information online. You can email us. We have an ask the rabbi um, option. We can schedule a free consultation option. It's all there on our website, puafertility.org. And uh, I encourage everyone because no one, no one should do this alone. No one should do this without rabbinic support or emotional support. And, and there's so many resources to help the community at large. Everyone should take advantage. So thank you so much. And that was puach.org if anybody wants to reach out. Yeah, P-U-A-H fertility.org. Thank you so much for being here today. And if anybody has any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out to me at laurimetz.net.